Okie dokie, welcome back. Let me get my little pointer here. All right, so let's talk about the alternation of generations. This idea of a succession of multicellular haploid and diploid phases. And although this isn't unique to land plants, it is a defining feature of the land plant, something that they all have. So they all do this alternation of generations. So land plants possess two multicellular generations, what we call the gametophyte generation, which is haploid, and we, what we call the sporophyte generation, which is diploid. And um, it's called alternation of generations because each generation is responsible for the processes that in turn create the other generation. So it's a cycle. So and we talked about this a little bit in the protus chapter, but let's now look at it in the context of an actual organism. And the organism we're going to look at is a fern. So this is one type of plant. Um, you probably already knew that. Um, and we're going to look at alternation of generations in this organism. <clears throat> so in this figure, the blue arrows are showing you haploid, or one set of chromosomes. And the pink is showing you diploid, or two sets of chromosomes. Now you'll notice that on the boundaries here, we have meiosis and fertilization, because those are the two processes that will bring us from being uh, diploid back into haploid state, in the case of meiosis, or bringing us from a haploid state back into a diploid state, in the case of fertilization. So let's start with what we would call the sporophyte generation here, because this is what you probably recognize, right? This is a fern. Um, and in the case of the ferns, um, the sporophyte generation is this structure right here. It is the multicellular diploid form. And this diploid form will produce spores by the process of meiosis. So um, this, this organism, this fern, will have structures called sporangia, not shown here, but that will produce spores. And these um, spores are produced by the process of meiosis. And when meiosis occurs, it takes a diploid cell and makes it haploid. So we now have these haploid spores. But they don't just stay as a single cell. What's going to happen is this haploid spell cell will germinate and through the process of mitosis will become a multicellular gametophyte. And in the case of the fern, it kind of is this little heart-shaped, relatively small, um, relatively small structure. But it is multicellular. The gametophyte, which by the way, gametophyte literally means gamete plant, and sporophyte means spore plant. So this gametophyte, you see these little funny bumps on it? Um, those, those are the structures that are going to produce gametes. And it's going to produce gametes through the process of mitosis. Now, to some of you, that might sound kind of strange because we're used to think of we're used to thinking of gametes as being produced by meiosis. But in this case, the gametophyte is already haploid. So, if it were to do meiosis, then it would it would reduce the genetic material yet again. That would be bad. Um, so, it produces these gametes through mitosis instead. These gametes can then fuse in fertilization. Ideally, it'd be gametes from different plants so that we can get some sexual recombination. The process of fertilization brings us back to a diploid state, and that first cell that is formed by the fusion of gametes is known as the zygote. That zygote is then going to divide by mitosis, and produce the multicellular diploid sporophyte. And then we've come full circle. Now, depending on the group of plants we are looking at, the appearance of the sporophyte and the gametophyte are going to vary. Sometimes, as is the case with this fern life cycle, the sporophyte is the larger, more conspicuous plant, and the gametophyte is quite small. 
By contrast, some of the groups we'll look at, such as the mosses, the sporophyte is going to be very, very tiny, and it is the gametophyte that will actually be the larger, more conspicuous plant. This is going to vary from plant group to plant group. And also, the appearance of some of the different structures are going to vary from plant group to plant group. But the basics of this alternation of generation is going to stay the same, no matter what plant group we're looking at. So let's examine some of these structures. So in the sporophyte, and the figure I showed you didn't actually show you up close these spor th this structure. So in the sporophyte, we have a structure called the sporangium, which translates to spore house. So spore and then angium it translates to vessel or house. So the spore angium is a diploid structure. Um, that is going to be going through meiosis to produce numerous haploid spores. So we have our sporangium here that is going to house the cells that will undergo meiosis to produce haploid spores. Okay, so here's an example um, of a moss, a sphagnum moss, and so um, the sporophyte is this, just this stalk with this ball on the top, and this ball on the top is the sporangium. That is made of diploid tissue, and on the inside here, are cells that will undergo meiosis to become spores. Okay, so right now, they, you know, just depending on whether they've undergone meiosis or not, we would call them spores. So here, it looks like they have, so we have many, 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 many spores. These spores can germinate and grow by mitosis to produce the multicellular gametophyte. I'm out of room. Okay, the multicellular gametophyte. Sorry, out of room. But it's in the notes. So let me show you um, what I mean by germ a spore germinating. Uh, i got to jump ahead a little bit. This is alternation of generations in a moss. <clears throat> And I like this because it shows a germinating spore. So here's our sporangium in the moss, AKA spore house. Cells within this sporangium undergo meiosis to produce spores. Now here are some ungerminated spores. When they hit the right environmental conditions, they will germinate. The spore wall splits open and a cell is inside. This cell will reproduce by mitosis to form this multi-structure gametophyte, okay? So that's what I mean when I talk about a spore germinating. And this spore germinates and produces the multicellular gametophyte. Okay, I hope I'm not making you seasick. Sorry about that. So let's talk about some gametophyte structures now. So let's imagine our spore has germinated um, and we now have a multicellular gametophyte. Okay, so in the gametophyte, we have a gametangium, or gametangia, plural. So a gametangium is a haploid structure. 
um, that goes through mitosis to produce haploid gametes. Right, because a gametophyte is already haploid. <clears throat> the gametes, ideally, are then going to fuse, hopefully with a gamete from a different plant, to uh, form an embryo, form, well, first a zygote, then an embryo, then a multicellular embryo, um, which will eventually... the adult sporophyte, right? So our gametophyte produces gametes, and then when they fuse together in fertilization, we produce a zygote that undergoes mitosis to produce the multicellular adult sporophyte plant. So these gametangia are important. Um, so we actually have even different types of gametangia depending on whether you're making male or female gametes. So here, um, you are looking at the structures of a plant known as a liverwort. And we're gonna look at this very genus, Marcantia, in lab. So we're seeing examples of male and female gametangium. So what's called an antheridium, is the male gametangium. So um, this is the structure that is going to be producing sperm. And I'm specifying in non-vascular plants and ferns because when we get into our seed plants, uh, our gymnosperms and our angiosperms, it, it, the structures are going to be a little different. They'll still have the basic alternation of generations, but they don't have the same sort of antheridium archegonium set up exactly. Um, the female gametangium is known as the archegonium. So that is our female gametangium. Um, you know what? I want to throw in a term. I want to throw in that it is a multicellular structure. Um, so this is the multicellular structure um, that produces eggs. in non-vascular plants and ferns. Again, when we get into our seed plants, things are going to be a little different because the, um, the, the uh, Archegonia and Antheridium are going to be so, 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 so greatly reduced. Um, it's, it's just a, a slightly different situation. So, but don't worry about that yet. We'll, do, we'll worry about that when, they get there, when we get to those plants. For now, let's just focus on our non-vascular plants and our ferns, um, which have these Antheridium and Archegonium. So, um, this um, archegonium is the multicellular structure um, that is going to produce eggs in, and it is a haploid structure that is making haploid eggs by mitosis. And by the way, this antheridium was also a haploid structure making haploid sperm by mitosis. Okay, that's what the gametophyte does. Um, so here we're looking at a liverwort, and here are our archegonia. 
so this kind of vase shaped structure and within these archegonium um, we have an egg that is produced and then here is our male gametangium known as antheridia. So we see this kind of club shape. And within this club shape are numerous, numerous, uh, club shaped structure are numerous, numerous uh, ferns. Um, and uh, in this particular plant, the liverwort in this genus Marcantia, we actually even have separate male and female gametophytes. So here's the female gametophyte that has the female gametangia, the archegonia, with the eggs, and here's the male gametophyte that has the antheridia containing the sperm. And you can see they actually have a slightly different shape. And that is not particularly uncommon in non-vascular plants, um, uh, early, early land plants, to see separate male and female gametophytes. Okay, so we're gonna look now at um, some diversity in modern land plants. So I'm gonna go back to this figure because it's way better than looking at a table. Um, so we are gonna start by looking at what we call the non-vascular plants. Um, so the non-vascular plants um, are sometimes collectively called the bryophytes. And so here they are. So here are our non, what we call our non-vascular plants. They are typically um, herbaceous, which means non-woody. Okay, they don't put on woody tissues at all. Um, they're usually pretty small, um, and they're usually close to the ground. And um, the reason for this is they don't have any kind of system so this vascular refers to vascular tissue, which is a system of tubing that will allow plants to pull water up from the ground. So because they don't have this, they rely on simple diffusion to move water around. So being close to the ground is kind of important. Um, they also lack true leaves, stems, and roots. They have structures that are kind of similar to leaves, stems, and roots, but really true what we would call leaves, stems, and roots have vascular tissue, have veins in them. Um, and so we say that the non-vascular plants therefore do not have leaves, stems, or roots. And they rely on water for reproduction. Um, and we'll get into in a few uh, slides why exactly that is. Uh, but basically, we can kind of think of these as being more early to diverge. And so they have a greater dependence on water. They need to be in a relatively moist environment because they haven't, they didn't really evolve uh, adaptations to make them really good at pulling water out of the ground very deeply. Um, and they also don't have a strategy to reproduce away from water. So of the land plants, the non-vascular plants are a little more tied to water than the other ones. So you can kind of think of them as being not quite as well adapted to life on land as some of our uh, later groups, such as the angiosperms or the gymnosperms. So there are three phyla that we're going to talk about. So this is the phylum hepatophyta. which we sometimes call the liverworts. And the word wart means plant, by the way. The phylum bryophyta. These are our mosses. And our phylum anseriophyta. Oops. the hornworts. 
So the word wart just means plant, and by the way, phyta um, also is referring to plant, so just a little tip, if you see a, a, a phylum name come up and, and you see phyta at the end of it, it's a pretty good clue that that's a, a plant, so maybe, maybe that'll help you. All right, so here we have a couple of tables that um, kind of break down some different characteristics of these groups. Um, also tells us a little bit about how many species we have in each of these groups. And we're going to focus right now on these non-vascular plants. Oh, I already had the drawing right here. All right, our non-vascular plants. All right, so we're going to take a little break here, and then I'm going to come back and actually talk about these groups.